You're listening to Navigating the French on Paris Underground Radio. For more great content and a bonus episode of Navigating the French, please join us on Patreon. Hello, and welcome to Navigating the French, the podcast where each episode we take a look at a French word and try and see what it tells us about French culture. I'm your host, Emily Monaco. What the hippies were to North America, the 68ers or Soissons Chita were in France. To address this political movement that essentially saw France shut down in May of 1968 is Dr. Ben Mercer, senior lecturer at the School of History at the Australian National University. He'll be exploring how this movement embodied some values of French society that still hold through today. All right, and welcome to the podcast. Ben Mercer uh, is here uh, to talk to us about this awesome revolutionary word. Ben, before we get into Soissons Tritard, could you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Okay, thanks, Emily. Um, so I'm a historian of 20th century Europe. Um, I work on the protest movements primarily of the 1960s and the 1970s in France, in Italy, and in West Germany. And I teach contemporary European history at the Australian National University in Canberra in Australia. Amazing. And so, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of overlap and we're going to get into the nitty gritty of that as the podcast goes on. But obviously we are here to talk primarily about France. And so the word that I've uh, sort of chosen to govern our podcast today or our episode today is Soissons-Tritard. But before we start talking about Soissons-Tritard, which ARD is kind of an ending that we throw on to the end of people who participate in a movement, like, you know, people who were part of the commune or communard, things like that. We, of course, need to know, well, what is Soissons-Trit? And Soissons-Trit in the French context, we're talking specifically about May Soissons-Trit, May 1968. So, and I know this is going to be tough, but in a Cliff's Notes kind of fashion, could you tell folks who aren't familiar with the events of May Soissons-Trit kind of what, what does May Soissons-Trit evoke? What happened in May of 1968 in France? Okay, yeah. So what happened in May 1968? And this is a very difficult question to answer because so much of French history and the second half of the 20th century, people just invoke 68 as something that means all sorts of things. And some of them didn't even go on in 68. So the main events that occurred in May of 1968 is that there was a protest movement that emerged partially in the universities, protesting against university reform, against the Vietnam War, for political freedoms, for sexual freedoms. This protest movement escalated at the beginning of May 1968, primarily when it began to clash with the police. That created a wave of sympathy for the protesters, who weren't all students, but many of them were, and this then generated a moment in which you had a general strike, so a protest movement that then expands to incorporate wide sectors of society, and French society effectively just shuts down in May of 1968. It's the largest strike in French history, and the strike demands of workers in May of 1968 are extraordinarily varied and different. There's all sorts of things, uh, higher salaries, fewer work hours, the end of, of layoffs in factories, equal pay between men and women in the factories, sometimes what they call workers' control. So this general strike then becomes a very large event for almost the entirety of the month of May. It looks as if it's going to bring down the government of Charles de Gaulle. And so it looks like in some ways, an updated version of one of the most revolutionary uh, traditions in France, the moment when power lies in the streets and the government is going to be brought down. This isn't the result. Charles de Gaulle eventually uh, declares elections, um, and those elections end up resulting in a right-wing political chamber. So May 68 stands for a moment of revolutionary effervescence, of a moment of a vacuum of political power, when power lies in the streets, and in which the regular normal rules of everyday life have simply disappeared. Okay. 
And I think, you know, one thing that you were talking about with regards to sort of evoking these previous revolutions. So I, in a previous life, was a 19e mist, so I studied the 19th century in France. And that's another time of a lot of, you know, revolt and, um, and people actually, you know, taking to the streets. And I do think, you know, in one of the slogans that we see for the 68 arts, the sous les pavés la plage, they're kind of evoking the imagery of the 18th and 19th century French revolutions. Are there any other ways that you can think of that they were really trying to ally themselves in the, in the, in, in the image of the, I guess, in the mindset of the people who were watching this all transpire throughout France? Do you, can you think of other ways that they were trying to evoke those original revolutions in, in their imagery? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the major way in which the previous revolutions of France have, are invoked in May of 1968 is by the building of barricades in the streets. So some of the first really important moments in the month of May is when students clash with police. This leads to different moments in the month where you have clashes between a broad protest movement who build barricades, picking up the paving stones, the cobblestones of the streets, building barricades and engaging in uh, quite violent clashes with the police. Something like 2,000 police are injured across the course of May. Um, a number of students, we have, don't have quite as good figures on the number of students injured as we do have of, on the police. But this invocation of barricades harks back to previous revolutions, particularly in the 19th century, particularly the Paris Commune and even 1848. And, and ultimately, when we're talking about Soissons Without, I mean, really the term in some respects, follows on from Kalanwita, so of somebody who was a person who had engaged in the revolutions of 1848, or communa, so taking that tradition. So not only linguistically, but also in terms of the nature of political symbolism in the streets, the building of barricades, you have a calling back to previous revolutions. All right, so as you were talking about this sort of linguistic aspect of the term Soissons-Tritard, as we're moving into this term as a description of someone, it's a word that we use today long after May 68. And in some time, in some ways, it almost feels like a generational term rather than evoking someone who actually participated in any sort of strikes or something like that. Do you sense that, you know, you can use the term Soissons-Tritard as someone who is allied with the beliefs and of, is of the right age to have participated in Soissons-Trit? Or do you really feel like a soissons has to be someone who sat on the, who, you know, didn't, who did the university strikes or was part of a strike movement in May of 68? It's a really interesting question. I mean, I think one of the strange features of 68 is that it, this is now 54 years ago, right? And it seems to be an event that still defines how we think about contemporary politics. Now, there's not many events 54 years ago that we really use to do that. I mean, sometimes wars, well, there's still obviously a lot of the discussion about the Second World War and so on. But this is a quite a different event. And the fact that we're still using it is in some ways quite strange. Um, and I think one of the reasons we're still using it is that there is a broad identification with the ideas or the ethos of 68, even by people who weren't involved in it, and frequently by people who came long after these events. I mean, there have been surveys in France that ask whether people identify with 68 or with what they think the ideas of 68 were, and something like 78% of the population sees 68 as a good thing. So there is a broad identification with it. Whether we would call everybody who broadly identifies with 68 or as um, Soissons Without is, I think, another matter. I mean, the term tends to be used, I think, primarily for those who were participants in the event of 1968. And quite frequently, and this is perhaps an, one of the most interesting aspects of it, it's not even used by everybody who went through those events. And when it emerges, I mean, the term Soissons Without really only emerges in the middle of the 1970s. So it takes a, a good five to seven years before it starts being used to describe people who have been participants in 68 and then become uh, identified with 1968. 
it's also true that a lot of people who involved themselves in 68 didn't always see themselves as 68ers, if you're going to translate it as, as, as sort of a 60, as that, as that term. So frequently the idea that we have of a 68er nowadays tends to be a student radical from the 1960s and is usually male in the, in the press and in the media. They tend to be people who've now gone on and had significant political careers or media careers afterwards. So those are the people who often stand in for who it is to be a 68er. Um, but that doesn't actually cover a huge number of people who are involved in the events of 68. So when we think about Soissons Wittard, I guess, you know, a basic definition would be someone who participated in 68. But a lot of people who participated in 68 probably wouldn't call themselves necessarily a 68er. And the ones who do, frequently it's that 68 was for them a particularly important event in their lives or in their careers. And most often those are people who were relatively young in 1968 itself. And so therefore it is, in that sense, often a generational term, as you said. It's referring to somebody who was, say, 18 to 25 or in their 20s, possibly, or even teens in 1968 and at the time of those events and then took from those events part of their political and personal identity thereafter. And I feel like, you know, the the reverberations of 68 as an event feel really palpable in French society today. I mean, one thing that I've definitely noticed coming in as a foreigner and kind of observing the ways in which, you know, the French react to politicians, for example, I mean, one of the slogans of 68 was soyez réaliste, demandez l'impossible, be realistic, ask for the impossible. And I feel like, you know, you see this right to assembly, but a right to strike, a right to manifest in the street. And the French do take that right very seriously. And, you know, here in Paris, there are strikes and assemblies pretty much every weekend of people asking for change and people demanding change. Do you feel like that's you know, the, the actual right to be unhappy and to ask for more is, is part of what they wanted in 68? Or were there very specific, and I'm speaking, you know, obviously we, you were talking earlier about the strikes of, you know, um, specific groups, you know, we had miners and dockers and all these people who were striking for workers' rights. But when you were striking as a student and we were part of that generational movement, what sort of specifically, aside from just this, like, were unhappy with a lot of things. Was there was there some sort of thing that they were trying to get out of all of this civil unrest? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the complicating factors is that there there's a lot of very specific demands, absolutely, but it is also this broad, very diffuse demand for change, political change on the one hand, but also change in daily life and personal relations and the attempt to create something new. So, I mean, broadly, you can describe 68 as something like an anti-authoritarian protest that involves certainly affirmation of the right to demonstrate, the right to protest, forms of direct democracy. So this is particularly, say, the assemblies of 1968, where People would get together and then they would debate frequently endlessly about how they wanted to proceed. And as mu- it's almost as if in 68 it was as important to spend that time debating and arguing about what life should look like as to come up with very specific demands. There were specific demands in these protest movements, but very frequently they don't always agree on what specific demands should be. So within the universities, frequently it was a abrogation of the reforms that had occurred recently in the in the middle of the 1960s, which largely were aimed at dealing and making the university more conducive to creating what the French government at that time thought would be the future jobs uh, coming out of university. So it tried to streamline university education. And also, there was a lot of complaint against styles of teaching within the university, uh, professors who were seen to be authoritarian and just lecturing at students, and that there was no right to speak within the university. If you're enjoying this episode of Navigating the French, you may also be interested in our sister podcast, Romancing in Paris, 
which delves into love, lust, and so much more in the City of Light. Navigating the French will be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Navigating the French. So there were a very large number of demands, but what characterizes the protests of 68, therefore, in some ways, is just that these demands are for immediate change, that people should be able to work out what they are themselves. They're not wanting this to be a top-down reform coming from political elites or even from the elites within institutions. It's an attempt to demand autonomy at the level of daily life. And this frequently emerges in forms of provocation uh, and transgression. It's a rejection of traditional politics political parties and the traditions of institutions, whether those are universities, whether they're factories, whether they're whether that's government, that an attempt to democratise that at a daily level. The problem, of course, becomes that once you want to democratise this and debate on it in an assembly, then you come up with all sorts of disagreements on what you actually want to create. And it's frequently true that, at least in retrospect, Many complain about the student assemblies or other assemblies that they're, in fact, highly undemocratic. I mean, they tend to be places where the best speakers hold sway. So they're experienced as something which is sort of radically innovative and inspiring, but they also have aspects to them that, in retrospect, people frequently take a distance from them. And this is particularly true, for example, of the feminist movement in the 1970s, which points out that all of the leaders that are thrown up by this movement in 1968, or almost all of them, tend to be uh, you know, white male middle class students who then dominate because they're the best speakers. And this isn't a movement at that particular moment that is particularly interested in gender equality. So mm-hmm. there is very definitely as part of this long French tradition of a right to protest in the streets of the desire to uh, to march, to protest, but it takes it further in the desire to create at the local level in assemblies, in factories, the ability to sort of determine how institutions and how people's lives work themselves um, without any control from above. Yeah, and that's something that I think, you know, it's it seems to be a continuation of, you know, this push for equality. I mean, we see uh, through the 19th century, I mean, even even beginning in the in the 18th century, you know, Tocqueville it, it, watching the American Revolution and, and examining the, the French unrest and sort of saying, you know, that I'm going to poorly paraphrase, but essentially that, you know, the French would rather be equal in chains than than free and the opposite was true in the United States and I think that there is there has constantly been this push you know if you look at the communard and then you look at 68 it's this push for not as you say not a top down governance but you know some sort of imperfect equal equal democracy and imperfect being of course the operative word but I think we do see you know some you know as you were you were talking about this this uh, push to to decide what we want, and then all this time spent debating over it. That's a word that longtime listeners of the podcast will know the, is still really important to the French. This debate, and I believe, unless I'm mistaken, that there was a push as well to remove some of the hierarchical aspects of the French language, or to or to not necessarily cow to them quite as much, and to to tutoie everybody. Is that something that was happening in 68, where people were saying tu and people were beezing everybody rather than shaking hands? Or is that more allegorical than actual reality? Yeah, there's some of that. I mean, I suppose it's, it's very definitely part of this tradition of a push for equality. I mean, one point which may, may, may be useful to think about is What's really different about 68 in terms of the revolutionary tradition is that there's no attempt to seize power. Most revolutions really are about seizing the power of the state, so overthrowing a government. I mean, there is no really... there. I mean, they set fire to the stock exchange at one point, but there's no storming of buildings. There's no attempt to overthrow government in terms of a violent a storming of, say, political buildings or anything like that. So it's not... In that sense, the same as many of the revolutions that preceded it. 
Um, it looks, and that's why some some people claim that it's it's more like playing at revolution because it invokes a revolutionary language, it invokes revolutionary symbolism. There is barricades and there is marching, but there is no attempt to seize power. And this is a revolution in many ways against the French Communist Party, which embodies the revolutionary tradition of communism in the 20th century. It's clear that most of these people protesting do not want communism, at least not as it's um, embodied in the French, uh, the French Communist Party or the Stalinist Eastern European form of communism that was very much present to people's eyes in the 1960s. Some of them did want some sort of communism or socialism, but it was not a communist, Stalinist, Soviet-style one that they wanted. So you have this attempt to create something different that is not a seizure of power, but is a transformation of the way in which people interact. So you do get this very much in 68, and particularly in the month of May, this sense that social relations have been transformed utterly, that people with whom you had nothing to do previously and would never have spoken, now you can have in-depth conversations about the meaning of life or about politics or about the future. There is very much at times, and in, in certainly in some locations, the basically an attempt to abolish deference. Now, this can occur linguistically, only using the informal. Um, there's also very frequently other forms of a turn to sort of informality in language. I mean, there's often a demonstrative use of uh, uh, swearing and a sort of an informality in the way in which people express themselves. So this is very much something which becomes evident in the way in which people re in interact. And there's also, I mean, this also plays itself out uh, not just in language, but in uh, clothing. I mean, there's there's a moment in the late 1960s, if you look at the photos of 68, it's quite striking that some of the early photos, many of the students, at least the male students, are in uh, basically a shirt and tie and often a jacket. But this rapidly changes and they rapidly begin to adopt more informal clothing. And there's a dropping of deference towards people who would normally have been considered social superiors. So this a facing of social hierarchy is very much a part of the protest movement of 1968. It is also, it's probably important to say, very much a part of broader changes in society in the Western world at the time. I mean, the, the impact of consumerism is largely speaking one in which a quite hierarchical society has its differences slightly effaced, they're certainly not abolished, via access to consumer goods rather than... So you have, a, you have changes in the way in which people are identifying themselves. And this is playing out also in the movement of 1968. But there's absolutely a drive towards informality, to throwing away traditional forms of respect, of deliberately provocative language, and an attempt to abolish traditional forms of tradition in many ways, both linguistically and and otherwise. And that seems like a really clear heritage of this movement that we can still see today. I mean, I remember when I first moved here being, uh, frankly, a little shocked at how often the French resort to vulgarity, but it's not, it always feels a little bit intellectualized here. It's it's not a sign that you don't have a better word to say. It's, it's almost like you've actually really chosen swear words or, uh, you know, I, I just think it's very interesting the way that that you can intellectualize swearing. And I, had, I hadn't quite realized that that was such a heritage from, from 68. I do wonder also, is there, can, can we link in any way the current work hygiene habits of France to, to this movement at all? Things like the 35-hour or 37-hour work week uh, or five weeks of mandated or, or five weeks of paid vacation, things like maternal or parental leave. Do any of those rights in France have links to, you know, what the 68ers were fighting for? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, I think it's actually a much older tradition, though. I mean, the the shorter work week, the issue of paid vacation goes back to the 1930s and the popular front government of the 1930s, which introduced a shorter working week, um, paid lead in various ways. So that was a long tradition in French politics that came out of or was put forward by various socialist parties throughout the 20th century. 
what Marx characterizes as 1968's uh, relation to that is in some ways the rejection of of the idea that vacation leave is sufficient. It's not for most, for many 68ers. I mean, the, there's a one of the, there's a slogan on on the walls at one point in '68, which says something like, you know, in my my father fought for higher wages, a longer weekend, and now he has a car, or I have a car, I have a holiday house, but my life is dead, and something like this. That effectively, it's not enough to work longer hours, get better wages, have more consumer goods. The point is not to have better working conditions. The point is to transform the nature of work and the nature of society more generally. So there's, I think there's definitely this element of 68 become is part of a tradition of pushing forward rights of workers, of shorter working weeks, but it also is a moment at which there's a very strong criticism of ideas of simply having higher wages or more consumer goods, that this isn't really sufficient to be happy. Um, and that criticism is quite charged in the 1960s uh, and not really as much uh, probably a couple of decades later. Now, I think what's interesting too is when we when we look at sort of the 68ers today, so if you if you said as as we were talking about it as a generational movement, if they were 18 and 68, oh no, my my lack of mathematical skills is going to be showing now. <laughs> Let's see. They'd be 73. They'll be 73 years old now. So what sort of characterizes the that generation as they come into middle age, as they as they do, you know, graduate from university, get a job, have a family? Do you find that the 68ers and like the gauche caviar are in any way overlapping? Is there a Venn diagram of sort of this leftist, upper middle class political bent and someone who would have been part of the 68ers? Or do you think that this this tapestry of who a 68er is now or was in their, in, you know, sort of their, their middle age and who a 68er was in, in 68, is, is that, is there a big difference among that group or do they all kind of come into um, society in a similar way, I guess is what I'm asking. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting question. What happens to people after sixty eight? Um, I mean, there's. I think the part of the problem is is that almost anybody who is politically engaged and ends up having a career in politics very frequently they were involved in sixty eight in some way, um, especially if they're on the left. If they're on the right, that's less certain. Although certainly some were involved uh, more broadly in in what was going on in sixty eight. So you know this idea of you know the the gauche caviar or um, people who uh, eventually exchange full time radicalism for effectively a very good career either in media or in politics. These people certainly exist. They're probably not very representative of the majority of people who were part of the movements of sixty eight. Um, what you see really is a wide variety of different paths coming out of 68. So you have some people who who take 68 and and they just engage in full-time radical activities for really the next decade, sometimes more, um, in which they, they sort of dedicate their lives to full-time radicalism. And probably only in the late 1970s or in the 1980s, after François Mitterrand comes to power in 1981, do they gradually begin to reintegrate into a more professional life. Some move out of society in many ways and try to create their own. So you have, in the 1970s, examples of communes, of attempts to create anti-authoritarian education, of effectively trying to drop out of the system as it exists in France and create something new, more democratic, more egalitarian in some way. Um, And a lot of these people don't really ever have much of a career because they've taken 10 to 15 years of their their working lives out in full-time political radicalism or uh, countercultural activities. But you do have others who eventually move back into the mainstream left, particularly in the late 1970s. I mean, the, the idea that the revolution 
is going to actually occur, which appears to be one of the, I mean, it's one of the conclusions people take from 68 is that revolution is still possible, that it's going to occur, that it may well occur in the next few years. This is just a sort of trial run. Um, And a lot of people take the notion that the revolution is still coming quite seriously. But this is not something that can really be said to be the case after the middle of the 1970s. Um, By the late 1970s, the idea that the revolution is around the corner has really sort of, it's difficult to maintain. I mean, there are some people who continue to maintain this, but the mass movements that come out of 68, to the extent that they were revolutionary, most people don't really believe that the revolution is around the corner in the late 1970s. And it's a very different political context globally by the late 1970s and then the early 1980s. If you're enjoying this episode of Navigating the French, you may also be interested in our sister podcast, Don't Miss This, which will clue you into some of the most interesting events happening in Paris right now. Navigating the French will be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Navigating the French. So you have, broadly speaking, a growing detachment from the idea of revolution across the 70s. So by the late 1970s, anybody who was really active in 68 and believed in revolution in some way has probably started to detach from it. And at this point, you see various paths. A lot of people go into just ordinary jobs. Frequently, as I said, they effectively have lost a decade of their career. Others manage to make a transition because they were already prominent, and this is true of the people who are the most important or the biggest figures, the biggest celebrities of 68, they find it the easiest to reconvert themselves into an important figure elsewhere. And, I mean, in some ways, this is just not very surprising at all. I mean, some of the people who were very important in 68 and leaders in 68, you know, they had gone to the the top schools in France. Um, It's not really surprising that they ultimately have a stellar career whatever they do when they decide to come back out of the revolutionary milieu. So you have a real variety of how people respond to that revolutionary wave, which takes probably a decade to play itself out. Um, By the 1980s, there's no real connection to much of the revolutionary ideas of 68. Um, The the movement that tends to have the most continuity is the feminist movement, because while the far left movements that come out of 1968 tend to lose their credibility and lose their appeal by the end of the 1970s, the feminist movement has significant achievements to its name in the 1970s, but even it, by the 1980s, um, there's uh, questions of how it deals with a socialist government in power and whether that moment of political protest and activity outside of parliament has changed into uh, working within the system or working with the system in some ways rather than trying to abolish the system altogether. So you do get this, you get some people who begin to work within the system, you have others who continue to believe in revolution, but that's a declining number, and you have others who, although they were far left radical revolutionaries for much of the early 1970s, then make other careers for themselves or eventually end up in government themselves. Wow. Well, Ben, thank you so very much for taking us through just some of the um, elements of this important and essential period in French history and, you know, the the people who, who made it happen. I really appreciate you coming on today. I just have one last question for you before we let you go, and that is, what is your favorite word in French? Uh... <laughs> I like that one. So coming back to, to uh, forms of informality and, uh, and language. So yeah, that would be my favorite. For folks who don't know what it is, you're going to have to Google it because we're trying to stay PG on this podcast. But Google it. It's a good word. Thank you so much, Ben. And I uh, hope to speak with you again soon. Thank you, Emily. Lovely to talk to you. This has been Navigating the French. You can find more from me, Emily Monaco, at Emily underscore in underscore France on Twitter and Instagram. This podcast is produced by Paris Underground Radio. To listen to other episodes of this podcast or to discover more podcasts like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com. Thanks for listening and à bientôt.
This episode of Navigating the French was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more great content, join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Paris Underground Radio.